Okay, guys, let's uh, let's start. Welcome to Cancer Center Grand Rounds. And my hope is this is the last Cancer Center Grand, Grand Rounds when it will be snowing of the year. Okay, <laughs> so I think we can be somewhat optimistic. We have two fabulous presentations today. Um, the first is uh, from Seth Herzon. Seth is a member of the Department of Chemistry. He's an associate professor of chemistry at Yale, also a member of the DT program, and also a member of the Cancer Chemistry Colloquium, the Triple C meeting, which meets in the provost's office um, with Dr. Herbst and Dr. Schlesinger and Dr. Herzon and, and, uh, and others, and Scott Miller. So we're delighted to hear his first talk, which will be on synthesis and study of anti-proliferative natural, product, natural products. Dr. Herzon. Okay, so yeah, so thanks for the uh, introduction, Tom, and happy to be able to come over here and uh, show you uh, some of my group's research. This is a very different um, uh, audience than what I'm used to. Usually, I'm talking to chemists, so I'm kind of excited to present this to you, present some of our more translational uh, research to you, and definitely get your feedback on some of uh, sort of directions what you might think is interesting. Um, it's stuff that we're really excited about, um, but my training is in. Uh, synthetic organic chemistry, okay, so I'm used to things that generally aren't alive. Um, and we're starting to move more into um, sort of looking at anti-proliferatives, looking at their mechanism of action, uh, but it's very much a, a new area of research uh, uh, for my group, a new direction. And so um, I thought I would start with sort of a brief introduction sort of to uh, what we do very broadly. And so <coughs> My group is interested in uh, natural products chemistry. And just for, um, uh, I wasn't sure who would be in the audience, but I thought it'd be useful just to define what a natural product is. Basically, it's any small molecule. Typically, we're talking about something that's less than 1,000 Dalton's uh, molecular weight uh, that's produced uh, in nature. So typically, we isolate these from plants, animals, and, uh, and bacteria. <clears throat> and so the question is, what are they good for? What are they good for in their native state? That's a really interesting question. Why do why does nature make all of these molecules? Uh, often they're signaling molecules. Often they're used um, uh, sort of back for bacterial warfare. Uh, we isolate them. My group doesn't do it. But natural products isolation chemists uh, harvest them from nature, characterize them, and then sort of look for um, uh, unnatural uh, applications of natural products. Okay, And um, as it turns out, uh, they're quite useful for many different diseases. So I'm sure many of you know sort of the frontline antibiotics are all natural products. Um, cancer, of course, is uh, something that's benefited from, uh, from, from natural products. And you can look through the literature, and about 47% um, of clinically prescribed anti-cancer agents are uh, natural products themselves or uh, derived directly from a natural product structure. If we allow that um, sort of definition to expand a little bit and say, OK, maybe starting from a natural pharmacophore or something, uh, the number increases uh, to sort of the mid-60s. And so <clears throat> clearly, they're of utility, um, <clears throat> very important molecules. Uh, these are some of the uh, uh, molecules that um, you all may be familiar with. So taxol, the vinca alkaloids, dolostatins, bleomycins, actinocidin 743. These are all natural products uh, that are clinically used uh, to treat uh, different cancers. I got, she got the email about the shortage in the uh, vinca al alkaloids last so year, and I thought that would be. Is that kind of side 743 Yandels? Yes, that's right. Yeah, so that alkylates uh, guanine. Uh, so I got the email about the shortage of the vinca alkaloids. I thought that would be an interesting project. Right? But that's a tough project. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, so, um, so what does my lab do? So. <clears throat> The primary focus where all of our projects start is really in what we call total synthesis. So basically taking simple chemicals that we can purchase that are inexpensive and converting them to a natural product structure in the laboratory. So the bulk of our experiments are done in, you know, in round bottom flasks on a stir plate. Um, but then I think what we try to do is we try to pick targets that, are, that have some sort of biological activity that are interesting from a, from a synthetic standpoint. Uh, and then use our chemistry to really explore uh, their activity. And so what I'll tell you about today are some uh, natural products that cleave DNA. And we've been looking at the mechanism of action of this DNA cleavage. And it turns out to be uh, quite interesting. Um, <clears throat> other things that we're interested in are natural product biosynthesis, so probing the way uh, by which uh, uh, nature prepares these molecules. Uh, and we do some of that in my lab, particularly looking at uh, 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 
natural products derived from different bacteria, Solanospora. And so, really, so where does, um, you know, what is the uh, potential sort of impact of, of, of chemical synthesis on sort of drug discovery, on the development of, of, of new sort of mechanisms uh, for, for chemotherapies? And really, sort of one of the primary um, benefits is that we can access structures that are difficult to obtain from the producing organisms. So many natural products are abundant. For example, Taxol, we can get from uh, the yew tree. Um, but some are not. And oftentimes, it's very difficult just to get a sample of the compound uh, to study its biological effects. And so we can do that with synthesis. I think But what's more sort of uh, important and more, much more powerful is actually being able to modify the natural product structure in a way that you can uh, connect, uh, say, molecular structure with biological function. And in order to do that, you need to have a very good handle uh, on the, uh, on the uh, synthetic chemistry and be able to manipulate those structures with a high degree of control. And so we can do that through synthesis. The other thing that we can do is prepare affinity, pro, affinity conjugates and probe molecules for target ID studies, so like protein pull-down uh, experiments and, and uh, investigations of that nature. And then if our syntheses are efficient, uh, and we've actually done this in my lab, we can develop efficient syntheses of natural products in a way that impacts supply. And so we've made an anti-neurodegenerative uh, alkaloid in a superzene A, uh, which uh, we actually got patent protection for the root. And so now that, that's being scaled uh, to a GMP process uh, by a uh, private collaborator. And so <clears throat> I want to just tell you about one project from the group um, uh, because of the, the, the time constraints. And that's our work with these molecules here. Uh, known as the kinomycins. So these are bacterial metabolites. They're produced by a strain of uh, streptomyces. They were isolated in the early 1970s. And from a chemical standpoint, they're very interesting molecules because they have a dinitrogen substituent fused to a carbon atom. So we call that a diazo group. And that is embedded in this five-membered ring, which is fused to the synaptoquinone. Okay? And so this structural uh, arrangement of atoms we call a diazofluorine. Uh, and these are the first molecules that were known uh, to contain the uh, diazofluorine functional group. Um, <clears throat> in 2001, then, uh, these two metabolites were isolated uh, from a strain of selenospora. They're known as lamavatysins A and B. Okay? And if you just look at them quickly, they're nominally dimers of the kinomycins. So it looks like I've got two diazofluorines fused together. And that's the case. So there's a diazofluorine down here. There's a single carbon-carbon bond uh, that bridges that diazofluorine to the second uh, half of the molecule. Okay? <clears throat> the other major difference, though, is in kinomycins, I've got uh, hydroxy groups or acetates over on this D-ring. In lamavatysins, I've got carbohydrate residues. Okay? And so when we started this work, there were two lamavatysins known, lamavatysins A and B. Uh, lamavatysin B is a degradation product of lamavatysin A. So this oleandrous residue is uh, quite acid labile, can hydrolyze, you form a tertiary alcohol, which closes in on the ketone, and you generate this hemiketal functional group. And so that occurs twice in lamavatysin B, and you get a very rigid sort of butterfly uh, type of structure. So <clears throat> in all honesty, we were interested in these at the outset because of their, their structures. We wanted to try and make them in the laboratory. Um, but we were also interested in their cytotoxic uh, cytotoxicity. So <clears throat> We do a lot of work with uh, Craig Cruz at the uh, screening center. And so we can send these compounds over, get them evaluated against cancer cell lines. And so these are the IC50 values of lamavatysin A and kinomycin C. This is just a representative kinomycin uh, against four different cell lines. And what you can see is that lamavatysin A is a subnanimal or inhibitor against three of those four cell lines, whereas kinomycin C um, is sort of in the hundreds of nanomol range. Well, this is kind of intriguing if you think about uh, why that might be. Uh, one hypothesis uh, that we and others have had is that this diazofluorine is sort of the pharmacophore, the reactive warhead, if you will, uh, of the natural product. And so if I were taking lamavatysin A and bringing in two diazofluorines, one would expect roughly a doubling in potency. Uh, but we don't see that. The molecule is much more active. And so that's something that we wanted to try to understand. Um, <clears throat> Many different groups have asked the question, what are the molecular mechanisms underlying the cytotoxicity of these metabolites? Okay, so these are in vitro reactivity experiments, performing chemistry on these molecules themselves or related analogs, and then asking the question, what are the products that are formed? Okay? And so it's, it's, 
It's a large body of data, and I basically synthesized it down here. And so it's been suggested that these things can covalently modify uh, biological nucleophiles by direct addition to the, to the uh, diazo group. You can generate reactive carbon-centered uh, free radical intermediates. So uh, these types of free radicals form the basis uh, for the cytotoxicity of molecules known as the ene dienes. So colichiomycin is, is, is a well-known example um, that was actually incorporated into an ADC known as mylotard. Um, it's also been suggested that they can generate electrophilic orthoquinomethide intermediates or acylfolvine uh, intermediates. And these two compounds could also take up biological nucleophiles. So we wanted to sort out these different uh, reaction pathways and really identify the one that was most important for cytotoxicity with the goal of using that information to tune the structure uh, of, the, uh, of the metabolites. And so <clears throat> I won't go through the details uh, of these um, synthetic chemistry. Um, I just want to kind of like convey to you uh, the key strategic elements, what we're able to do in the laboratory, the compounds that we're able to make. And so the hypothesis at the outset was that the diazofluorine was the uh, pharmacophore of these molecules. And so we need a good way to prepare the diazofluorine functional group. And so what we did was we developed chemistry where we can take these naphthoquinones uh, with these uh, unsaturated ketones. So TMS here is trimethylsilyl. And then in three reactions, we can build up uh, the diazofluorine functional group. And what this allows us to do is basically bring, bring together different naphthoquinones with different uh, unsaturated ketones and sort of mix them, match them, and access uh, diazofluorines with many different uh, substitution patterns. And so we developed that chemistry, and then we applied it to a synthesis of kinomycin F. So we're able to make this in the lab. And then by modifying the synthetic route a little bit, we were able to access this molecule. Uh, which we call lomeva A glycone. So this is essentially the natural product uh, without the carbohydrate residues. Okay? And so <clears throat> at this point in our work, we wanted to think about making lomeva Tyson itself, and we needed to install the carbohydrates. And there were actually some, some major issues with this. Um, this is the structure of lomeva Tyson A as depicted in the isolation paper. And the carbohydrates are shown here, and the way they're drawn uh, is meant to uh, indicate relative uh, but not absolute stereochemistry. So in other words, I could have the mirror image of uh, either mirror image form of, of both carbohydrates. And so what this translates to synthetically is that we're going to end up making lots of different lomeva Tyson derivatives in order to arrive at the correct structure. And so we didn't want to do that. And so what we did was we got the producing organism Okay, so it comes from a strain of Selenospora. Uh, that strain was deposited at the USDA. We were able to uh, request it and then begin to culture it in the lab. And what we wanted to do was isolate natural lamiva Tyson A, cleave the carbohydrate residues, and get their absolute stereochemistry. We didn't see any lamiva Tyson A in the fermentation broth, but we did identify other uh, new lamiva Tysons. Okay, and so what you're looking at here is the HPLC chromatogram okay, at 310 nanometers of the fermentation broth after seven or 10 days. And these are the three new metabolites uh, that we pulled out. And so we went through the whole uh, structure elucidation of these molecules. And um, I will just cut to the chase and show you the structure of lomeva Tyson C. So this is the one that is uh, the most important to us. This molecule is basically identical to lomeva Tyson A with one exception. So in lomeva Tyson A, I have a diazo group here and here. And in lomeva Tyson C, I have a hydroxyfulvine uh, instead of the second diazo group. Okay? And so we could isolate lomeva Tyson C. We could do an acidic digestion on it, get the carbohydrates, establish their absolute stereochemistry, so they're both of the L form. But what we really wanted to do was relay this information to lomeva Tyson A. And so we developed chemistry in the lab where we can treat lomeva Tyson C with a reagent known as trifluoromethane sulfonylazide and do a direct diazo transfer to build up uh, the second diazofluorine functional group. And we can compare that semi-synthetic material then to the natural material. They're identical. And so we can make the complete uh, structural assignment. And so why is this significant? It's significant from a synthetic standpoint because we now know what we're actually trying to make, uh, which is always a good thing. <laughs> and um, it's also synthetic, uh, important from a um, sort of a mechanism of action standpoint, because lomeva Tyson C is produced in relatively high yield, so about 30 to 60 mg per liter. It's a quite stable compound, so we can isolate it and store it in the freezer uh, for months. And so we've been able to procure 
about a gram uh, of lamivatycin C in my lab. And so when we want to study A, we do the diazo transfer, we purify the product, and then we can move forward. And so, <clears throat> so now let me get to the uh, mechanism of action studies. And so basically, we have access to all of the compounds on this slide. So the ones on the bottom, we get to, uh, through synthesis. Lamivatycin C, we get by fermentation. A, by semi-synthesis that I just showed you. And then B, actually, by degradation of lamivatycin A. And so we really wanted to start to uh, look at the mechanism of action of lamivatycin A. And we can essentially frame this in terms of three questions. So we'd like to know what are the structural features that engender it uh, with such potent activity? What are the biological mechanisms underlying that activity? So in other words, what is the biological target? And then what are the molecular mechanisms behind the cytotoxicity? So what are the reaction pathways that are important uh, for cytotoxic effects. So, can yep. you characterize the cytotoxicity of lamivatycin C? <coughs> Next slide. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the first thing we did. So we sent lamivatycin C over to the screening center, OK? And basically, if I express the relative potency of lamivatycin A and C, A is up to 6,500 fold more potent, OK? And the only uh, uh, structural difference between those two is the presence or absence of the second diazo group. And so that tells us right away uh, that that is very significant. So one could make the argument that maybe lamivatycin A is, is more potent than the kinomycins because of the carbohydrates, or maybe there's some target recognition uh, effects that, that we're getting. But this clearly shows us that uh, you need this dimeric uh, diazofluorine functional group. Did you patent that? Did you figure that out? No. No? No. Yeah, <laughs> maybe I should have. <laughs> um, so anyway, so, so, so these molecules have planar polycyclic aromatic ring systems. And so um, other molecules that target DNA, such as doxorubicin and stuff, look a lot like these. And so we started to look at DNA as a potential target. And so we did a fluorescent displacement assay, basically measuring the amount of uh, uh, binding of the molecule uh, to uh, DNA that is saturated with a fluorescent intercalator. And basically, the higher the bar uh, on this graph, the stronger the binding. So lamivatycins A and C both bind with uh, relatively high affinity. Um, we then wanted to uh, get more detailed structural information. So we were actually able to establish an NMR solution structure of lamivatycin A bound to uh, an eightmer of a DNA duplex. And so that's shown uh, on this slide. Thank you. And this was very surprising to us because our initial hypothesis was that maybe one of these days a fluorine intercalates uh, between a base step and the other is sort of uh, positioned in either the major or the minor groove. What was clear from the NMR data is that both of those days of fluorines actually jam uh, into the DNA uh, duplex, okay, and actually push it open um, in a way that was that was quite unexpected, and so. <clears throat> That tells us a little bit about, um, at this point, we know a little bit about the target. So we know it can bind DNA. We have some information about the interaction of the molecule with DNA. Uh, we wanted to sort of return to the chemical uh, studies and ask the question, what are the chemical pathways that are important for, for cytotoxicity? And so this is um, sort of an expanded version of that uh, graphic I showed you earlier, showing all the intermediates uh, that can form from the diazofluorine and potential mechanisms for their generation. Suffice it to say, we've collected data that essentially uh, not only excludes all of these other uh, possibilities, but really supports uh, generation of vinyl radicals as being important uh, for cytotoxicity. And so that's what I'd like to, um, to focus on. And so <clears throat> this is a um, mechanism for formation of the, um, of the vinyl radical from lamivatycin A. So one could get electron transfer to the diazofluorine, addition of a proton, formation of a semiquinone. Okay? And then if you work through it, you can lose dinitrogen and convert that species directly uh, to the vinyl radical. Okay? If this vinyl radical picks up a hydrogen atom at the uh, carbon, uh, you would form this molecule, which we now know is uh, lamivatycin C. So basically, reduction of lamivatycin A uh, generates uh, lamivatycin C. And so we began to study this process in more detail. All right? And so there are two pathways that we're interested in. So the first is the reduction of the first diazofluorine to convert lamivatycin A to lamivatycin C. And then the second reduction to convert the remaining diazofluorine 
uh, also to a hydroxyfolvene. So I call this a double reduction product. Right? And so these were the experiments that really, I think, shed a lot of light uh, on the mechanism and provide a lot of support for this vinyl radical intermediate. So <clears throat> if I take lamavatycin A and simply warm it up in methanol okay, at 37 degrees, we see a reduction, uh, hydrodediazotization, uh, to form lamavatycin C. And this was very surprising to us because there was no exogenous reductant uh, that we were adding. So um, ene dienes and, and anthracyclines and things get reduced by things like glutathione and other sulfur-based nucleophiles. Here we aren't adding that to the reaction mixture. So presumably methanol is the reductant. It's getting oxidized to formaldehyde. And this is fairly remarkable uh, for an organic molecule uh, to be able to do that. We can conduct the same experiment in isopropanol. The reaction is faster, so it's about twice as fast. Uh, but we see very clean uh, reduction. And the molecule is stable in tetrahydrofuran. So that's a non-reducing uh, solvent. <clears throat> And so then what we did was uh, we took lamavatycin A up in uh, a mixture of deuterated methanol and deuterium oxide. And the hypothesis here was that if I'm generating a vinyl radical at this position, I should incorporate deuterium there. And we see that. So we get about 95% uh, uh, deuterium incorporation at the vinylic position. And so that's additional evidence for uh, the intermediacy of this vinyl radical. And then we did an experiment which is really interesting. So we wanted to probe for sort of the competency of this radical to abstract a non-exchangeable hydrogen atom from DNA. And so what we did was sort of an inverse deuterium labeling experiment. So we basically took uh, uh, cathimus DNA and then lyophilized it over and over again from D2O. So in this way, we can exchange out all of the um, heteroatom bound protons. We then incubate with our molecule, and DTT is reductant. And what we get is two products, about a one-to-one -one ratio. So we get lamavatycin C, as well as the double reduction product. Okay? And so the hypothesis here is that if lamavatycin A can abstract a non-exchangeable hydrogen atom from DNA, um, we should see proteation at this position. And we see that. We get about 67% hydrogen atom incorporation in, in lamavatycin C and about 59% in the double reduction product. So that tells us that it's going in and getting at a non-exchangeable uh, hydrogen atom, probably from the ribose uh, backbone. If we leave out the calf thymus DNA, we still get um, uh, hydrodediazotization. Now we get about an 81% yield of lamavatycin C, higher levels of hydrogen atom incorporation and a little bit of the double reduction product with the comparable level of uh, H-atom incorporation. And so, <clears throat> so it's interesting to us. And so we went back to the crystal structure and what you can, or sorry, the NMR structure. And what you can see from this, if you look at the yellow hashed lines, is that the diazo carbon is relatively close uh, to uh, a ribose in each strand. Okay? And so the distances here are within about 3.6 angstroms. So this is the other one. Okay? And <clears throat> That led us to the question, can this molecule induce um, a double strand break uh, in DNA? And so that's one of the most potent mechanisms uh, for damaging DNA. And so we did what's known as an H2AX phosphorylation assay. And so basically, we're looking at uh, phosphorylation of the histone protein H2AX as a response uh, to uh, uh, DNA double strand break. And so this is the flow cytometry graph uh, from that experiment. So we basically label the cells with fluorescent anti-H2AX uh, anti-gamma H2AX antibody and count them by flow cytometry. The blue line is uh, lomavatycin A. And so what you can see is that it potently induces uh, double strand breaks. The other line that's important here is the brown one, which is lomavatycin C, which is buried down uh, in the controls. Right? And so this gives us a very clear understanding of why lomavatycin A is so much more cytotoxic uh, than lomavatycin C. We can titrate down the amount of lomavatycin A going down to about 390 picomolar. We still see a significant amount of uh, double strand breaks. And so <clears throat> this is kind of the state of the project now, what we think about the mechanism. Basically, this molecule can dock inside of DNA, generate a vinyl radical intermediate. That cleaves one strand. The second reduction then occurs, and we can, can get complete uh, double strand uh, cleavage. What's interesting, though, from these studies, you might have picked up on this, is that in the methanolysis and the isopropanolysis experiments, we only see the first reduction. We don't see the second. And so that tells us that the oxidation potential of lamavatycin A is much higher than lamavatycin C. Okay? And if you look at how these molecules are bound in the double helix, they're stacked on top of one another. Okay? And so many of you probably know that uh, the oxidation potential of, of DNA bases is modulated by the 
the, uh, the uh, sort of neighboring bases and the pi stacking interaction. So what we're thinking is that on intercalation, we're actually raising the oxidation uh, potential of the metabolite by enforcing sort of this uh, uh, pi stacking interaction. And that's something that we're trying to probe. And so that's basically it. So, um, so we're trying to look at how intercalation influences the oxidation potential. We'd like to know what is the source of reducing equivalence. So I showed you that we can reduce these molecules in the presence of DNA without a reductant, uh, which is very intriguing. One possibility is that they're directly oxidizing uh, the, the uh, base stack, potentially a guanine or a GG step. Uh, we're probing for that. We'd like to know which hydrogen atom is then removed uh, from DNA. And then we actually have a collaboration with Pfizer uh, to look at dimeric diazofluorines as payloads for ADCs. And so uh, truth in advertising, lamivatycin A will never be a useful drug. So it's very unstable. Um, it's not produced in high yields by the bacteria. Um, and it's just broadly cytotoxic. But if we can use the information that we've gotten from, from sort of the structural analysis and the chemical reactivity of these molecules, we can identify the compounds that should be uh, synthetically tractable, that should potently induce double strand breaks, and we can potentially evaluate them uh, as payloads for, for ADCs. And so that's um, sort of where we're headed with this project. And so finally, just acknowledge my group members and um, who have done all this work, and then collaborators, a couple of which are, are over here. Uh, and then uh, these agencies for financial support. And then thanks again for the invitation. Very happy to be able to share this with you today. Did you ever see the evidence of uh, the covenant interaction with the DNA based on your mechanism? Yeah, so the question is, did we ever see evidence for covalent modification of DNA? And we've, we've probed for that uh, in vitro, looking at just adding um, nucleotides and stuff, seeing if they, they, they form addicts. We don't see any of it. In these experiments, we did these on sort of a semi-preparative semi scale, so about five migs of material. And particularly in this one, we're getting almost quantitative recovery of material. So if it is covalently modifying, it's small amounts. to the intercalation and the lead to the breakage of the DNA in the affected cells. So what is the mechanism yes. leading to the, to the breakage? So this is, we're trying to get at it on a, at a, on a molecular level now. So we think that it's abstracting hydrogen atom from the ribose. You get a carbon-centered radical, OK? And then those are known to decompose to basically lead to cleavage of the ribose, cleavage of the nucleotides. That's and the hypothesis. Yeah. Yeah. You really don't have evidence to support that. Um, well, yeah, we haven't nailed it down completely, I would say. So yeah. I think the one of the yeah. possibilities is I look for your, if you incubate the cells, yeah. you should be able to, oh, sorry, you should be able to take a look what happened to the DNA. Is any interaction right inside the cells? Because the mechanism could be purely through its interact, due to this active group, mm -hmm. interacting with uh, some other components of the cells. So don't rule yeah, out yeah. that possibility. Not with, like with a protein target or something? Yes, like that? and yeah. I think you can, if you really want to go after, you can even make an antibody out of it. Right, and the see where it goes. It. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So that's uh, yeah. another intriguing thing I saw is this, uh, cannot my thing. Mm -hmm. You have uh, two cell lines very different in cytotoxicities. One HCT11 is 0.034 nanomole. Another HENA is 4.5. How do you explain that? Yeah. Um, That's very intriguing. May also point yeah. out potential. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So in the, in the isolation report, they tested A against 25 cell lines. And it was basically. So I think like the mean IC50 was around uh, 7 or 10 nanomolar. But then it was picomolar against um, the HCT116, um, ovarian, and then also, I want to say, um, leukemia, although we really didn't. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess we did see that. Um, I don't know why it's more potent in those cell lines than heal it. Maybe an issue like, like uptake or degradation of the metabolite before it gets to the target. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Here you have a big difference. 
So, so I, I would, as David, I, my suspicion is that the HCT, HCT 116 cell lines have probably been fully sequenced at this point. Mm -hmm. And you can actually look and see if there's, you know, from a bioinformatics standpoint, see if there's any obvious targets that pop up. Dr. Yarbrough? Yeah, I was, I was just had a question about the intercalation and the effect of that. What happens at, if there is a double strand break, which gamma H2AX looks like there is? What happens after the double strand break? Does it still stay intercalated? Does that somehow inhibit repair? That's uh, do, a great are question. any of those things known? Yeah, no, that's a great question. We don't know at this point. Yeah, but that's right. So it could be also not just inducing the double strand break, but also preventing repair. Yeah. Bonnie? So, um, you know, following the chemistry, I was actually intrigued that the Lomeva Tyson A, which is different from the C by just that N2 group, mm -hmm. has as high as a 6,500 fold difference in potency. And in sort of following your mechanism, um, I guess I'm wondering if you think it's solely due to the increased oxidation of that first N2 group or whether it's the fact that with the Lomeva Tyson C, you're only able to induce a single strand break when the oxidation happens and that's easier to repair, or whether there's something else going on in the mechanism that you haven't yet gotten to address from where you are. Yeah. So my inclination is that it's, it's be, because C basically doesn't have the capacity to, to, to induce double strand breaks as efficiently, but certainly the first reduction is much faster. and so. You know, one, one uh, model would be not that a single molecule is inducing a double strand break, but you've got two, and they're sort of hitting complementary strands. And you're just getting much faster reduction of A, uh, as opposed to if you did the same thing with C, the reduction would be much slower. So, yeah. Terrific. Um, okay. That was a fantastic presentation. Unfortunately, we don't have